So I'm going to be recording this for my mindful social podcast. It'll also be on YouTube, but I've just, I'm so excited to have Kathy here. And we were just saying, I'm really glad that we're on Blab because this is a really great format where we can have a longer form conversation and, you know, listen to what Kathy has to say. So Kathy, why don't you introduce yourself for starters and tell us a little bit about you. Oh, sure. Um, so my company is Keeping It Human. And what I am is a storyteller. And that's really at the heart of what I do. And it's helping companies tell their story in a way that's really human, no jargon, has high empathy, all the things that human beings want and need. Mm -hmm. And we forget sometimes. We forget that there's a human being on the other end of doing business with us and they don't care about our stuff. They have their needs and we have to figure out what that is. I also have a background in comedy, which I think is the best kind of storytelling school that I could enroll in. So <laughs> right. I try to keep it human. And comedy forces you to do that. I think I learned more about connecting with people from comedy than I ever did with my MBA or business or working in corporate America. So I don't find that hard to believe. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about how storytelling works for marketing a business, for example, and how we can take a kind of more mindful approach of the, the people that we want to talk to mm -hmm. in telling that story. How does that happen? Well, I think it always starts with understanding the core need of your audience. As, as you know, we're all marketers here, but it really starts with empathy. What is the big thing that your customer has to do every day that is a headache, that is painful, is something that they have to do because their credibility re relies on it? Is there a way that you can help make their life better? How can you make them be better, do better, look better to their company? Mm -hmm. How do you help them enhance their reputation and their internal uh, credibility? If you can figure out that human need, you'll know the story that you have to tell. And a lot of times we're still caught up in social selling and I send you an invite on LinkedIn, you accept it and five minutes later, I'm shoving stuff <laughs> at you and I'm not ever really understanding who you are, what you need, what your problems are. And it's crazy that we do business like that. Absolutely you know? crazy. Yeah. It's, it's just nuts. And really, you know, thinking about who it is that we're talking to and who that network is and what they want. That's just such core business. And I think that we've forgotten that because with the ease of social media, it's so much easier for us to just hammer people with a bunch of crap until they give in and click yes. We don't need that. It's horrible. So there's a guy, I'm nameless, um, who- <laughs> Guy number six. Guy number six. Uh, sadly, guy number like 60 this week. Yeah. And he keeps sending me LinkedIn um, notifications. Hey, sorry to bother you, but, and I'm thinking, no, you're not. Because if, you're not you, sorry. <laughs> if you even had a clue of how much, you know, any of your prospects are getting, you wouldn't say sorry, but mm -hmm. you're not sorry. Sorry, but not sorry. And that's just such a non-human way to think about how your prospect is just overloaded every day. And I still ignore him and he still sends me two a day. You can block those, you know. I, I, I finally did, but I thought he'd get the message and he didn't. Mm, yeah. So, you know. <laughs> My favorite ones are the ones that want to guilt me into it. I've sent you three requests to sign up for my lead generation course oh. and you haven't responded. Well, I'm sorry. I don't care about your course, <laughs> especially the ones that want to sell me things that I do for a living. 
I saw know? that. I saw that. Oh. And I'm thinking to myself, did they check Janet's profile? <laughs> Do they know she's a published author? Did they spend five minutes to even figure out who you were? And they didn't. <laughs> no, they didn't. But you know what? It's very, I'm going to, I'm going to out myself a little bit here. It's very not mindful of me to do what I did, which was posted it on Facebook because I was so frustrated yeah. with the level of these things that we get because it's mindless, it's thoughtless. They yeah. couldn't possibly give a shit about what we want yeah. or what we do. No. And so, you know, what we want to talk about, and I'm going to switch gears a little bit, is how to be more mindful of that market and how to build a story that's actually going to engage them and get them what they want. Yeah. So let's talk about that for a minute. Well, I love that you talk about mindfulness because I, I do this for a living and I'm always asking, how can I be better? How can I be more mindful of what my clients need and want or my prospects? What mm. are they, what battle are they fighting every day? And it's a battle of too much information, not enough time, stress, um, you know, total overload, social media overload. Mm -hmm. And the story that I need to tell is simplicity. How am I making their life simpler and more convenient? And that's the story that I'm really trying to be mindful of. So, for example, I went to send out a newsletter last week and I went, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to wait. They're being inundated with happy holidays messages with mm -hmm. buy for me, buy for me. And unless I'm adding value, I'm really not helping. I'm actually destroying value. So I'm trying to be mindful of my communications. And unless I have something that makes their life better and easier in the moment, they don't need another newsletter. No, no. You know, you need to add value to what they're getting, yeah. not just because you want to sell them something, but because you yeah. want to open up the doors, you know, if, if you write, for example, a story, oh, that's nice. You write a story around what it is that you're doing and who you are as a human being, they're much more likely to respond positively to you than they are if you're like, here's the story of my product. Isn't it great? Yeah. Nobody cares. We don't care yet. You have to figure out how to lead us up to that, that it, point. What about comedy? How comedy does that work? Is, comedy is about the truth. Uh, you know, I like to call it the truth on steroids because that's what it is. And so if you can mm. tell the truth about what problem your, your customer is facing and then really show that you get it, people will listen. So, I, you know, I, mm -hmm. I wrote about the top, like, um, bad business pickup lines on LinkedIn and people cracked up at my post and they started telling me their favorite bad business pickup lines. And it, it resonated because it was so true. And then I talked mm -hmm. about, well, here's what you could do instead. And pe pe it hit a nerve. It hit a nerve with people. And so if you can use humor to make fun of the truth and then say, here's a different way that you might think about that truth and how we can be better. Mm -hmm. People love that. They respond to it. You know. Sure. Sure. Can you give me any examples of that? Absolutely. Just put you on the spot. So yeah. we've talked about what not to do. Um, a, a vice mm. president of an analytics company recently approached me, and he uh, got to know me. He found out I was a Seinfeld fan and a com big comedy fan. And he started sending me jokes. So we exchanged jokes probably five or six times before he sent me a LinkedIn invite. So by the time he actually mm. sent me the LinkedIn invite, we had bonded over something really human, which was comedy. And then he invited me mm -hmm. to his company to talk about storytelling and to, uh, you know, talk to me about the story of his products. But it was in context and it was after I got to know him in a more human setting. And so by the time, you know, he sent me that invite, I felt like I knew something about him. And that was the right way to approach me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely more important to warm up the waters yeah. and, and, you know, just create those relationships. I mean, the, I know this is said a lot, but we don't buy from companies. Yeah. We buy from people. And even if it's a salesperson or whether it's a group of people, it's still a very human interaction. We tend to forget that. Absolutely. 
and it just gets yeah. lost. We have our social selling goals and we have our quotas and all these different things, but people aren't numbers and you're playing a numbers game. However, you know, there's a per person at the, at the other end, you know, what is it they need? And they don't need more stuff from you. Mm -hmm. So the one thing that prospects and, and customers will never tell you is if you're a big pain in the ass. If you're adding complexity, <laughs> they're usually not going to tell you. They'll just go dark. And if they go dark and you're mm -hmm. sending them lots of stuff, it's because they're overwhelmed and you have failed to make doing business with you easy. And most people will never right. come back and actually tell you that. So you have to mm -hmm. step back and be mindful of, did I add value? Did I destroy value? Did I send them too many cluttered things? Did I send them a page long email when just a couple sentences would do? Could I pick up the phone and say, look, I've already emailed you. You probably have questions. Let's talk about that. And we just don't do that. We think more social selling notifications are better. And that's just not the case. So, you know, stop totally and agree. think about, am I simplifying or am I adding just too much complexity? Because again, most people don't want to be the bearer of bad news. So they won't call you and say, Kathy, stop, you're a pain in the ass. Just stop it. So you have to be <laughs> really mindful about that. If they could call you and say that, you would you would know that you had a good relationship with them already, right? That would right? be insanely amazing because they would trust you to do the right thing. And and you're right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, they would totally, totally be willing to talk to you. Yeah. And that's something, you know, I wrote this uh, newsletter the other day because I am really bad at writing newsletters. I send out my yeah. blogs, you yeah. know, and I tweet my brains out but I never get my newsletters done. And so I sent an email out to my newsletter and I said, look, I am a really bad newsletter writer. And before I start writing any more, I wanna know what you want and you know what you wanna get out of this newsletter. And if I'm just talking to myself, I'll just go away. And it was really interesting. I didn't get, I didn't get a hundred percent response, that's for sure. But I did get some people who came back and really told me, what it was that they wanted to hear, what their problems were, what their pain points are. And then I can take that and turn that into blog posts and I can use it as newsletter fodder and, you know, give them what they want. But I kind of had to stand back and go, okay, I don't even know if I'm telling them yeah. what they want to hear. So, you know, now's the time for me to, to do that. And I got some really great responses, which was really yeah. good. And then I didn't write another you newsletter. Cause I don't want to sell the book now, you know, it's like, Oh, I haven't written you in a really long time. And now I've got this book. You've got to buy the book. So yeah. I, I won't do that. So I've got to add a little well, value. And I also I think that. you're smart to ask because I would challenge the assumption that says you have to have a newsletter. A lot of executives aren't reading newsletters anymore. They don't have time. So this idea that you have to do it, no, I don't agree with that. I think it may very well be in the evolution of your business. People are getting value from your posts, your blabs, your tweet chats, and you don't need to do the newsletter. So, well, thank you for validating no, that lack of decision. I think it's true. <laughs> People are, no one's saying to me, Kathy, please, please clog up my inbox more because I don't have enough. <laughs> I right. want to say, look, <laughs> if I'm not going to hit the nail on the head with what they need, why am I doing this and, and, and creating a situation where people aren't going to read it and I'm destroying value? Mm -hmm. So I applaud you for stepping back and looking at that. Most people just go into autopilot. <laughs> well, thank you. you know? Well, and, and, you know, if I was a client of my own, I would yeah. say, you know, if you're not loving what you're writing, if you're not excited about what you're putting out there and you're just doing it because you have to, it's not going to come out well for you anyway. Yeah. So, you know, I really think that you have to have that level of passion. You know who I think really does great newsletters yes. is Chris Brogan. 
he he does amazing newsletters. They're personal, they're human, you feel like his best friend. And I'm always amazed at how he can do that because I don't write to my friends as fr no, nice and as what he, he does. does in his newsletters, and you're absolutely right, is that he promotes other people. He is a champion yeah. of others, and it comes across as so sincere that um, I don't read a lot of newsletters anymore, but his is one that I do. So, so you're right. Mm -hmm. What a good model. Look at that. Chris Brogan. <laughs> Chris Brogan. And, you know, I also think that it's interesting that he chooses to send out his newsletter on a Sunday. And most marketers would say that was a really bad idea, but it's actually brilliant. I think if everybody did it, it wouldn't work. But, you know, that's it's kind of hanging around on the weekend when you're done with whatever you're doing. And, you you know, then you get your email and go, oh, there's an email from Chris. And, you know, it's going to be positive and uplifting. And smart so, to do. Yeah. Find out when people will look at your newsletter if they're interested in it at all. I've discovered from talking mm -hmm. to, to my prospects and, and customers and audience, people want videos and I don't need to inundate their box with tons of newsletters because as long as I'm giving them value in videos, the open rate is high. Mm -hmm. And if I wasn't, I can see the open rate plummet. So I think you're right. If you're not excited about doing it, don't do it. It's, it's better to pull mm -hmm. back and and not to keep you know hitting thinking that you have to do it and never questioning why you're doing it yeah and i i think that's something that a lot of us don't do as well yeah. is look at the data look at the open rates look and see you know how are people connecting with you are you getting responses are they taking action or is it kind of just going into the ozone and nobody opens it and if nobody opens it, then you got to look at the reasons why that might be and actually, gosh, think about it. Yeah, I think I think it's also time to really step back and challenge assumptions you've made in your business. The idea that you have to be on Blab or you have to have a newsletter or you have to do something mm. may not be true for your business. And if you're not looking at the numbers and where people are interfacing with you, you might be in the wrong channels. And that's a really important thing. Go to the channels that mm -hmm. add value for your customers. Be mindful of where they're hanging out and stop wasting your time in these other things that may not be helping them. And it's just more work for you and nobody wins. So, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, I think that's something that, you know, I mean, we all want to chase the the yeah. bright, shiny objects, right? And, you know, I am I am as guilty as anybody else. But, you know, when the end of day comes, I check out yeah. every single network and try it for a little while and then decide yeah. if I like it. And if it doesn't apply to business for me, I don't have time. You know, I have, I, I like Blab a lot. I love it. Periscope, yeah, who cares? You know, it just depends. Yeah. That doesn't work for me. Um, I'm big on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. I'm on LinkedIn. Pretty yeah. much it. Yeah. And that's enough for me. But it may not be the right network. It may not be where your people are. And going out and doing some searches, you know, trying to, to do a little research to find out where the people you want to talk to are, mm -hmm. are, yeah. are, then, you know, that's, that's a really great way to do it. So when you're talking to an organization about telling their story, how can you help them draw out that both the story and the humanity in the story? It's a great question. Um, a lot of times it starts with people have their product and it's never about the product. What human need are you meeting? So a lot of times it starts with a deep dive of, well, who are your customers and what's at stake if, they fail if they don't buy from you. How's their life going to be in pain? Let's talk about a human need. So sounds very simple, but go back to the hierarchy of needs in Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Somewhere in that pyramid, your customer has a human need. 
reputation, credibility, um, visibility, uh, freedom, financial freedom, um, physical freedom to, to work from anywhere, you know, a B, B and B. Um, I think about Airbnb and belong anywhere. That's a, that's a transcendent story. So go back to that and really hone in on that story. If you're really clear about the human problem you solve, and it's not about making money or saving money for your customer. It's about the freedom or something else that's human that you buy them. Mm -hmm. You'll never go wrong. You need to talk to that aspirational human story. And I think a lot of it starts, Janet, with the fact that a lot of companies get their big story wrong. 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 So how do they get their they big, get their story, big wrong. story wrong? because their, their story goes like this. Um, our customer had a pain point. They came to us, we sold them a product and we solved their business problem. And then they saved money, the end. That's a crappy story. <laughs> <laughs> it's not big. It's typical. It's a typical, it's a typical marketing one, story. And it's yeah. very superficial mm -hmm. because behind that buyer is a human being that is looking at you going, how are you going to make me look better, be better, increase my reputation for my boss to my company? You have to sell to not only the economic need, you got to sell to the personal human need of that buyer sitting across from you. And most of these marketing stories stop at the economic layer and the economic layer is very shallow. If, if they were to fail or buy the wrong product and somehow their reputation is in the gutter, what is the human toll on that buyer and you've got to speak to the economic layer and then the personal human layer. So if you really understand what's at stake for that buyer, you won't go wrong when you talk about the hum bigger human need. And that's where I think, especially in B2B, um, most stories just don't hit that mark. Well, it's really interesting that you say in b and B2B as well, because a lot of people think that social is a B2C yeah. medium, and I don't think that's true at all. I think it's a wonderful B2B medium, but it's a different conversation. It is perhaps. a different conversation, and you do have to speak to that rational need. It's true. However, if you're ignoring the personal need, you're ignoring actually two thirds of what gets factored in the decision to buy. So I don't know if you saw this, um, the corporate executive board and Google did a study a few years ago and in their study of B2B buyers, they found that two thirds of the, the decision factors to buy from a company was a personal need, not the economic need. That was a checkbox. Okay, yeah, that'll probably be a good solution. But the rest of it was, how are they gonna make me look? Are they gonna help me increase visibility, reputation, credibility, all these other personal things? And that actually was the mm -hmm. sway factor in a B2B to buy decision. Yeah. Yeah, because when somebody makes a B2B buy decision, they don't just have one KPI they're dealing with. They may have one problem, but they have other KPIs that you could probably help them with and maybe that they don't know you could help them with because they don't know the full story of what the opportunity is. So being able to explain that in a way that they can get it, I think even especially in B2B, we get so stuck with data. We talk about talk in white paper and press releases that are just walls of crap. That unless you're really into analyzing that data and understanding what it is, it's it's just noise. And it's really noise to hear ourselves talk so that we can say, hey, we're the best at this and we won this award and this is gonna achieve this, but it doesn't even come close to addressing the problem that the end user has or the buyer. There's has. a tendency in B2B, to, um, if, the buyers on the fence, we give them more white papers, more press releases as if that's going <laughs> to help. Data. And it's the opposite. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really about the buyer having a human feeling 
about whether or not you're going to make them look good at the end of the day. And that is an emotional mm -hmm. component. That is not more data. It's not a rational decision. It's really a feeling. And you have to make them feel that they're in good hands. And if your product is all about hitting the rational part of the brain, you failed. That's it. Yeah, because in the end, I don't think we necessarily make decisions with our rational no. brain at all. It's not that kind not of a decision. All. I mean, there's a great book you're right. No, you're absolutely right. There's a great book by Dan Ariely called Predictably Irrational. And this idea mm. that human beings think that we're rational. No, we're the most irrational people or beings on the planet, <laughs> I should say. We're completely irrational. We make irrational, illogical decisions. And we make them the justification with our emotions. And then we go to the rational part of our brain to justify that decision that our feelings have already mm -hmm. made. And that's the reality of it. Yeah, 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 that's really true. And and so we can be speaking yeah. more to that irrational side and supporting it and really, you know, communicating with people and, and remembering too that you know, a buying decision, nobody sees a tweet on Twitter and then instantly buys something. I nobody. Want a unicorn you know. like that in my client portfolio, because <laughs> that never happens. Okay, well, if we had unicorns, well, that's they might. That's true. <laughs> no, you're ch we're chasing unicorns and rainbows, and that that would be great, but that's just the beginning yeah. of the process. And, um, you know, if we could look at our tweets as also being mini stories uh, and not just shoving data at, at people, then mm -hmm. I think we would think differently of, and be more mindful about social media. Yeah, and I, I like to think, you know, that every once in a while, and, and I do it sometimes, sometimes I don't, I'm not perfect, but stepping back and looking at, what you've been putting out there and how it really relates to the story that you're trying to tell as opposed to the stories that you kind of start chasing because you see something shiny and you wander off and you know you don't come back <laughs> so you know how can we do that yeah logistically without having it seem like it's yeah. scripted too much you know there has to be we don't have yeah. scripted yeah. conversations yeah you know you know, I think it goes back to knowing why you exist in the world. What is your core story? For me, it's about humanizing marketing and simplifying. And if I'm going counter to that by adding more noise, then I know that something's off because I'm out of alignment with my story. And if you knew what that big mission of your story was, that's your GPS. That's your Northern Star. Mm -hmm. And if you vary from that, you've got to get back to it. And um, as I was saying before, I'm like you. If I go to do a newsletter and I go, you know what? This is a bunch of stuff that's adding noise. I'll just delete it and I won't send it till I have mm -hmm. something to say that adds value, simplifies solves a problem. And if I have a model mm -hmm. or something like a hack that will help people, then I'll send it out because then it's worth it. Then people see me as a simplifier, a chief simplification officer. And I don't care what your business is. You are Very in exciting. the simplification <laughs> business. I am, you are, everybody listening is. And if you're not doing that, something's wrong. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because really, you know, one of the things that happens with white papers and press releases and all that stuff is that we just inundate people with so much information that they're incapable of making a decision. When really, if we just listen to them for a while, we'll use Twitter as an example. Listen to what they're talking about on Twitter. Do they have the pain points that you need to address? Or are there other things that you can help them with? Because it's all about starting that relationship and that conversation before you ask me to buy something and really understanding what might that person's KPIs be and, you know, how can we help them get there? Um, you know, I think it's, I think it's really interesting that you said that your newsletter type really wanted more video. And I think people yeah. want more video because it's yes. easier to digest. I kind of think that's why, uh, 
podcasting has really taken off again, even though it was awesome before and nobody listened. Um, you know, so, so let's kind of yeah. go down that road as far as what tools can people be communicating on that are more human and less um, off-putting, <laughs> lack of a better word. You know, I think a lot about in terms of, you know, my time and if I'm an executive and I'm trying to sell to me, I don't have time to watch a long video. I don't have time to read, you know, a white paper. I don't have time for, you know, X, Y, and Z. So are there things and hacks and solutions that you can put together really quickly, two, three minute videos that address one need only, really simple, you know, one need, one solution per video. I can get mm. someone to watch a three or four minute video. I might not get someone to watch a 50 minute hangout, but I can mm -hmm. if they know that every week I'm going to put out a new video and it's going to deal with how to solve one problem for them. People will make that investment. So think about short, simple, easy, no jargon, just to the point. And I think that can be very revolutionary for people. Video is easy. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's also better that way because then people can look through a library of videos that you have and that you've put out yeah. and pick what is useful yeah. for them. Um, you know, Megan has a good question in the chat about, okay, how can we build out the editorial schedule and still have it seem approachable and, and making sure that the content that's in that calendar is actually useful. If you're gonna be publishing it at the same time every month, are we gonna save the good stuff? <laughs> oh, what's the best, what's a good way to do that's that? great question. Uh, what I've done is, and I'm sure you, you do this too, is go back and take a look at the types of content of everything you put out that's getting traction. What do people want more of? What do they want less of? And you can tell because you can see what people are consuming. Create more of the stuff people are consuming because that's telling you where their head's at, their need, the type of content they want. If it's video and quick hits, do more of that. So it's okay to keep a schedule for consistency, but drop the plan. If the plan was for a white paper and nobody's reading your white papers, that's a <laughs> yeah. big clue that you have a disconnect with the time and value people perceive with what you're putting out. You may think it's a value, but they're not reading it. So clearly you have a mismatch. So it's okay to, to just schedule, but maybe you don't mm -hmm. produce as much content. Maybe instead of three or four bits, you do one or two videos and that's it, but they're high value. So always make the trade off in favor of high value even if it's less than what you would normally put out in a given month. So less is more. Yeah. Well, I totally agree with that. And I also want to add in there that it doesn't have to be heavily yeah. produced. You know, uh -huh. things like lab, for example, it's a casual conversation, but the, if there's value in it, people will watch it and they'll share it and it'll be good for everybody. And making them very, very short and sweet because you know, like you said, nobody's going to watch an hour hangout or probably an hour blab unless we entertain yeah. them. And did I tell you that tap dancing was part of this? Kathy <laughs> um, <laughs> always delivered. I can tap dance. Not great, <laughs> but I can tap dance. Oh, I can tap dance if nobody's watching. <laughs> well, that's a great point you bring up. If you can entertain people, that's huge too. Mm -hmm. uh, people want something that cuts through all the clutter of their day. So if you can have them laughing and learning, that's great. That's incredible. That's a mm -hmm. gift in their otherwise boring, inundated, busy day. They will look forward to your stuff. They will open your stuff because they miss it when you don't send it out. That's important. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Megan yeah. agrees, you know, I, I really yeah. think it's huge. And, and uh, you know, I think some of the, some of the things that happen, you know, 
with like, there's a, there's a email I get every day called Martha oh, yeah. Toon. And he makes these hysterically funny cartoons <laughs> and he emails them out. You can use them in your content. And so it's really worth it to subscribe because every once in a while you'll come across one, you have to pay for them, but it's worth it if it's going to deliver the message that you want to deliver and that you can build on that and you've given them something to laugh and share about oh, at the same time. Humor is key. And well, I can't cartoon. Let me tell you, I wrote a post a few years ago that was actually pretty popular. And I said, think like a cartoonist. So if there's one mm. point you could make in your content, think about that headline because cartoonists think in one big punchline, that's it. One singular thing. What would it be? So if you're a cartoonist and you are in some way in your own content, what's that one thing that you know that could make a huge difference to your audience that would help them if they had that info? So think like a cartoonist, mm -hmm. think in headlines. And that's a great way to frame the content that you do. Yeah, and Megan has, a, I'm gonna have yeah. to have Megan back on. Megan has another good point here that, um, C3 does a good job with their newsletters that they bring current events into the title of the newsletter to kind of draw mm. people in and yeah. then, you know, creating the story around that and yeah. connecting it. That's a really, that's a great that's, tactic. It's a great Technique. idea. I love it. <laughs> yeah. It's a great way to stay relevant, yeah. you know, and I think that's what everybody's fighting a battle mm. over is to stay relevant and add value at the same time. Because if you're sending more than people are reading, people stop opening your stuff. And that's never good. Mm -hmm. So less is always more unless you're adding value. And so for me, 2016 is how can I add more value? And maybe the answer is less stuff. Mm. I like that answer. I like that answer a lot. I think that we're going to see a lot more uh just kind of attrition in social media that people are going to start dropping off of social networks yeah. they're not using they're not going to participate in things that they you know especially you know with with what's going on in the world and the political environment together people are inundated with this stuff and they don't want to hear it yeah. that's not what we want to get yeah. so that kind of leads into the idea of news jacking and is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Can we do it right? Can we do it wrong? What do you think about that? Great question. Janet, I knew you'd ask great questions. <laughs> um, Curious that's right. mind. <laughs> you know, I've seen it done well, and I've also seen it be horrible. And you have too. I know you have. Um, We've all oh, seen the fails. And they're, and they're bad. They're really bad. There's no in between. <laughs> Um, I think yeah. if you can take something and maybe reduce the fear or, you know, help in some way, that it makes sense. But sometimes the best thing to do is don't connect it to your product. Don't try to use it as an opportunity to sell because it's so mm. opportunistic that it's it kind of smells and there's a natural recoil kind of reaction that your audience will have. And that can backfire really big. And I've not seen anything that's made me go, wow, that was really done well. I think mm -hmm. if you do news jack, maybe there, there's a way to say, look, like with this, um, you know, yesterday was the anniversary, the third anniversary of Newtown. So maybe a subtle, a uh, donation for peace or just a message of peace and hope is all you need to do. Don't make it about products. Don't try to sell products. Please, the, please don't, don't do that product. because you'll have every mom in America on your butt and not in a good way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Not so in a good think, way. Think about the humanity of your audience, you know? Yeah, I, I really think that's key because you know, we, we want to say something and, you know, it's, it's really challenging. We manage a social media company and we run social media for a lot of organizations. So when there's a mass shooting, 
everything has to, you know, go yeah. silent because we want to be sensitive to that. We want to be paying attention. We want to be compassionate about the network that we're engaged in. And sometimes I really get pushback on that from the owners of the company that are like, well, no, we could we could build on this and we could use the hashtag to sell toothpaste. And I'm like, yeah, we're not going to do that. Get somebody else. But they do try to do it. Um, you know, and there have been some some massive fails like the um, Domino's incident with the why I stayed. You had pizza. Uh, you know, it, it's really easy. And it, I mean, if anybody listening even thinks about jumping on a hashtag, look at the hashtag before you use it. Because a lot of times people will just go, oh, that hashtag could apply to us. And it can go massively wrong. And also not looking at the hashtag before you use it anyway, because it may be used for something else that didn't never even occur to you it can be quite really shocking. true. <laughs> I remember when Robin Williams died and those of us in, you know, mm. all over the world were shocked, especially in the comedy community. And I had the privilege of seeing him at the purple onion in San Francisco, um, working mm. out some stand up material. And there was a company that seized on it and said, hey, you know, these things happen. Now's a good time to review your life insurance policy. <laughs> and I was mortified. I, oh, I went to Twitter yeah. and I was like, how dare you? And I wasn't alone. And, you know, just think, think about the impact. I think if it's a really big news event where people are scared, horrified, saddened, then the response mm -hmm. has to be one of that's respectful. respectful. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's about, it's about respect and not just for your community, but for the people that yeah. are involved, you know, and, and uh, I think there's also an other side of that in that, you know, we want to jump on all of the things that are going on, you know, and it's yeah. Christmas. So let's talk about Christmas 24 seven. Well, not everybody's Christian. Not everybody celebrates Christmas. And even if someone is Christian and sort of celebrates Christmas, it's not a happy time for everybody. So, you know, thinking about that and how it's going to re react to them. And, you know, it, it all goes back to thinking about who your market is and being mindful about what matters to them instead of what matters to you. Yeah, first. so true. If I get one more, like... Merry Christmas. Just now's a good time to think about changes in 2016. It is, to be fair. It absolutely is. Mm -hmm. However, if that's the same message, then everything kind of blends and you're not distinct from anybody else out there putting stuff out right now. So do something that your competition isn't, you know? Yeah, and absolutely. I love it. Maybe you could even say, how can you be more mindful in 2016? That's that's a great human mm -hmm. message. Yeah, yeah, it really is. And, and you know, it, it's so much easier to think about it that way. Yeah. Well, it's not easier. It's easy to be lazy and yeah. put out some piece <laughs> of crap that's, that's pointless. But it's easier <laughs> as a human to think about who you're yeah. talking to and, and create something that, that's going to relate to them. Uh, yeah. You know, it, it's it, these particular times, there's so much outrage and there's so much stuff going on. And it's tempting to try to tack into that, but it can go so radically wrong on you that it's just it's not going to be funny. At it all. really isn't. And sometimes a muted response is the human response. It's the best thing to do. Mm -hmm. And you said something that was a tweetable moment that I I laugh at because it's true. It's like making more <laughs> crap is easy. That's the easy road and mm. everybody's doing it. I think it takes more sensibility and more reserve and more mindfulness to not do that. And, and to me, yeah. the companies that pull back, I go, you know what? Good on them. They're thinking it through. They're, they're being mindful because everybody and their brother just puts more crap and uses it as an opportunity to, to not add value, to destroy value. You know, mm. and it's just yeah. noise. We don't need no. more noise. And, you know, it, it's also it's challenging because, OK, for uh, Twitter yeah. again, I go back to Twitter. It's 
challenging because you feel like if you don't keep tweeting on a regular basis, you're not going to show up in people's streams. And so people will be just incessantly sharing and sharing and sharing. If that information that you're sharing isn't valuable to somebody, then you're just making more noise. It's not really helping your cause. So let's talk a little bit about strategies that people can use to create content in a mindful, thoughtful, human way and plan it out. How can they maybe recycle a little even? That's a great question. And recycling is okay because well, you know so well, not everyone's going to see it the first time. And maybe you buried it and maybe people want shorter slices. So maybe, um, you know, Jay Bear talks about atomizing. Take part of an article, shorten it, and turn it into an infographic and repurpose it. I think mm -hmm. the thing to start with is what are the top three problems that I solve for my customers? How do I make them better? What are their pains? And how can I speak to their pains and also their aspirations? What do they mm. want from 2016? Personally, do they want career advancement? Do they want to be inspired? Chances are yes. Can I create content that makes them smile, helps them solve a problem? Mm. That's quick, short, simple, uh, graphic, video, infographics. Start there. And mm -hmm. that's the right way to think about it. Forget about just adding content just for content. I think a lot of companies make Always. the mistake of it's fun to show pictures of your Christmas party and all that. That's all fun. But it's even better if you can show pictures of your customers because then your customer sees themselves mm -hmm. in that story. So always be mindful. How is this helping my customer? How is it connecting to my customer? Does it help them personally, professionally? And that's the litmus test, I think, for everything that you do. It's a high bar, mm. but it helps you weed through things that you might go, you know what? No, that's self-serving and we shouldn't do that. I'll just put that <laughs> on a plaque somewhere. That's self-serving. We shouldn't do, do that. Didn't do it. <laughs> but I think something else you said that was really brilliant is aspirational. You know, being more aspirational with how you market your product and how you market your services. It's more like I, I can help you. I can help you reach that goal. I can help you, you know, have a better life. Whatever it is that you do, if you phrase things more aspirationally, I think that just gets a warmer welcome in the messaging itself. It does. And I think you can even just come out and say it. A lot of times we dance around it as marketers. You can even write a blog post that says, look, I know you have more to do next year than you can possibly do. And you're, you know, you're on the hook for a whole bunch of goals in your organization. So we're going to make your life easier and better. We're going to create less content. Mm -hmm. We're going to have more video and easier ways for you to get quick hits and quick bites because we care about your time. Do you know how great that is to see that in your inbox? You're like, Finally, they get it. They're thinking about me. And just come out and say it. People will be so grateful. You know? <laughs> Are you kidding? I'm going to steal that and I'm going to put it in my please. next newsletter so I can plan for Are 2016. You please, everybody, because that's how marketing is going to be better. We're all going to be better. Mm -hmm. I, th I think that's the future that we see with social media is that there is a shift in the mentality of marketers now that, you know, where it used to be, oh, we have to have a Facebook. Now it's we actually have to talk to people. And I think we're going to see so much more of that in 2016, less jargon, more humanity. Uh, you know, I don't know if you saw the um, oh, gosh, I think it was Swiss Air that had a this beautiful old man sitting on the mountains. You expected, you know, one of those big Swiss horns to come out. And 
people were walking up to a kiosk in a mall and he was on the video and he was telling them how wonderful the place was that he lived. And he told them the whole story. And if they responded and reacted, the airline would put a ticket in and they would fly them there to see this man and see this beautiful place in Switzerland. And I'm totally have it wrong on, I think it's actually trains. Yeah. And <laughs> I don't know where he was. I'm, I'm losing it. But it was that human interaction and marketing. Everybody just yeah. stopped and, you know, wow. And they may not have talked to him if they, he had been there in person, but the whole video interface and, and reaction really brought a lot to it. I think we resonate more with that now. And what if you could challenge yourself to maybe once or twice a week, send out something aspirational that has nothing to do with your products, doesn't even mention your products. Mm. Challenge yourself to do something like that because then people see you as a source of hope and optimism. You don't sell products. Mm. Every one of us sells optimism because our clients do business with us because they want a better situation. So if you can sell optimism, that's such a big part of it. I love that. Sell hope and I optimism. Yeah. Not the fear-based mm -hmm. social selling, you know, not that any of you would do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, Your no friend, one, your friends no one's come to this that. chat now. <laughs> I, I think that's really great too, that, that not every single message you send out has to have your product in it. You're trying to set the yeah. stage. You know, people forget that social media, although social selling does take yeah. place, it's really where you set the stage and start the conversation. You want them to pick up the phone and call you. You want them to buy your product. That's not gonna be in that first tweet yeah. that they see. It's going to be when they develop an overall feel of who you are and, and why we should care. So, you know, stop with the product, 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 yeah, product. Absolutely. If every time I'm communicating with you, you know, it's a product sell, you're going to stop looking at anything for me. You're going to delete anything. You're not going to mm -hmm. open it. You're going to be like, that's it. <laughs> Go away. You're going to nail it. that door shut and you have no credibility, mm -hmm. none, none at all. So if you can think like this VP of this data analytics company that I told you about, how can I engage in a human way? What are your needs? Have a conversation, nothing to do with my company or products. And then maybe on the fifth or sixth interaction, well, oh, by the way, would you like to come in and learn about our product? I'd love to talk to you about storytelling. That is such a human segue mm. that it made sense. I mean, you wouldn't ask somebody to marry you on the first date. So why don't we do that with LinkedIn? Mm. It's like, hey, accept my <laughs> invite. Oh my gosh, she likes me. Now buy my stuff, buy my stuff. Here's a ring, can I put it on your finger? No, <laughs> go away. Go away. Go it's, away. No different. it's no different. You know, it's just it's just bars as bad as they are have better pickup lines than LinkedIn. So there I said it. <laughs> That's absolutely true. I have another technique that that I've seen out there that I want everybody to not do ever again. You know how you get those endorsements on LinkedIn. I've had people endorse me for multiple things, multiple times. They don't know me at all. And then they send a connection request because they think now I owe them. Oh, oh no, I don't. I do not owe you. <laughs> and then they send me the, I tried to connect with you and you wouldn't. And now, uh, you know, now you should right. feel guilty no. message. It's just, it's amazing. It's amazing. Don't, don't do, do that. Don't do it. And then if you are going to endorse somebody, know something about their work and endorse them for something they actually do, not underwater basket mm. weaving, which I don't do. So that's <laughs> nice that you think I'm good at it, but I don't do it. So. <laughs> mm. Yeah. I, I really don't think anybody believes that endorsements are real. I put them as low as I could on my page because I don't really want people to see them. I want them to see my recommendations, but the endorsement thing, yeah. mm, no, yeah. it's crazy. I really do say 
you know, have the courage and the commitment to, if it's worth getting to know somebody completely, don't ask anything from them. Don't make your first request and ask for their time, an endorsement, a recommendation. Have five or six completely, you know, personal interactions before you make a request because you want people to see you as a human and adding value, not taking from you or destroying value mm -hmm. or wanting something from you. Build that credibility first. And otherwise mm -hmm. it's the relationship's gone. And you know, social selling is great, but we've forgotten the relationship part of all this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and there is an opportunity on LinkedIn to do yeah. it right. You can look at a person's profile and see uh, what yeah. groups are they in? Have they been writing blog posts on LinkedIn? Comment yeah. there and start a conversation before you do the ask. It's just Court easier. romance me. You know, don't just <laughs> yeah. try to put a ring on my finger. So at least buy me a drink, drink first. first. And if you do, <laughs> just call me the next day. Don't act like you didn't, you know, that didn't happen. And then you want a recommendation for me. Come on. Oh, I love those too. Yeah. Can you give me a recommendation? I'm like, I don't know you. You're and if you do, mind. then you're not credible because you're giving them to everybody. So it can't be yeah. meaningful. Yeah. 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 It's just a negative Absolutely. for everybody. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I want to wrap up the show, Kathy. And and uh, gosh, this has been great. I really enjoyed it's always fun to talk to you. You're doing such great stuff. And thank you for reminding oh. us how important mindfulness is because it matters. Yeah. Well, Absolutely. thank you. Why don't you tell people where they can find you and how they can hear more about Absolutely. what you do? Absolutely. Um, you can find me at www.keepingithuman.com. You can, okay. I'd say sign up for my newsletter, but don't. You know, I think... Watch my videos. I think they're easier. I'll they're sign up for mine either. <laughs> they're more simple. Um, and if any of you have ways to simplify things, I'd love to hear it. Um, you know, yeah, mm. you can see me on Twitter. I also do comedy. So uh, if you're around on the 23rd in Sunnyvale in the South Bay, come to Rooster Tea Feathers. I'll be doing some comedy there. Oh, yeah. Very cool. Very cool. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks again. And this was this was a oh, ton amazing. of fun. Um, I'm going to do a little self-promotional. I'm going to paste the uh, link to the new book in the chat. Um, I will have this recording up on YouTube in the next day or so, and it'll also be on the podcast. But if anybody has any questions, you can always find me on Twitter at jfouts, or you can email me at janet at janetfouts.com. And make sure that you... Uh, Sign up for Kathy's newsletter. She'll probably put something out someday. And whatever it is, we know that it's going to be well, useful, so. but it's not going to be. What would be helpful crap. if I can make a pitch is if those of you listening um, have ideas of, of things in storytelling that, like, what's your biggest challenge? What content could I produce that would be helpful to you? I'd love to hear it. Please drop me a line. That would be helpful. I've got a book on storytelling coming out next year. And so I'm always looking at how I can do it better. So thank you. Yeah. Mm, that's great. I'm going to.